Hello. I'm Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, let me warmly welcome you for the regular monthly clinical meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This actually would be the last monthly clinical meeting uh, during my tenure as the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, the, uh, I'm uh, glad that we would be having it in collaboration with the, uh, uh, the Sri Lanka College of Emergency Physicians in this month. We would be addressing a very important topic in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, but particularly in emergency care. So it would be piercing together the puzzle, uh, managing a critical ill patient in emergency department. So uh, as with many things uh, in today's context, it would be a, a multidisciplinary or um, a multifaceted type of a, a discussion that we would be talking on uh, with regard to managing a critical ill patient in emergency department. The first, it would be a case-based panel discussion focusing on approach to a patient with undifferentiated shock. Uh, I think it would be uh, discussed initially by Dr. Anusha Ambanwath. Uh, he is the uh, uh, emergency physician at Teaching Hospital, Ratnapura. So let me uh, cordially invite Dr. Anusha Ambanwath to commence the presentation. Anusha, over to you. Good afternoon, Madam. Just sorry to have taken it slightly off the schedule. I'm going to introduce ourselves and our departments for a 10 minute brief introduction, Madam. Mm -hmm. uh, and Anusha Ambanwala is actually a lady and uh, uh, all panelists are ladies today, so it's uh, I'm the odd one out here today. Mm -hmm. um, so is it okay, madam? Can I start first? Yes, and then yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everybody. It is indeed a privilege uh, as the Sri Lanka Emergency uh, College of Emergency Physicians to be given this opportunity today to collaborate for the first time uh, with this prestigious organization. Thank you, Madam Padma Gundratna, for affording us this privilege. Um, emergency medicine and emergency physicians are very new to the uh, uh, Sri Lankan medical profession. And some of you in this prestigious organization must be wondering actually who are these people, where do they work and what do they do? So over the next 10 minutes, I'm just going to briefly introduce everybody to ourselves. So what is the role of the emergency department? And our goal is really to strive to cater to a patient-centered care model. And ultimately what we want to do is improve the existing healthcare services efficiency uh, and collaborate with the well-established specialities uh, and complement them in our care to patients. So globally as well, emergency medicine is relatively new. It all started in the USA uh, after the horrendous assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy and, and established in 1979. And our closest neighbor, India, had its specialty recognized only very recently in 2009. Sri Lanka embarked on emergency medicine as a specialty in 2013 when the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine uh, established an MD program. Uh, 16 of us uh, qualified in the first MD uh, exit exam. And thankfully, by 2019, two of my colleagues became board certified uh, as clinicians and specialists in emergency medicine. So in the department, it's really the patient that determines the emergency. It's not us. You know, an elderly man who gets off the chair in the morning gets a severe backache that becomes an emergency. Or the young girl who's playing soccer, twists the ankle, that's an emergency. The young executive who cannot bear the stresses of life, contemplating suicide, this is an emergency. So emergencies that walk in through the emergency department door very often are determined by the patient. And all, if not many, patients that come in present with undifferentiated conditions. They all say chest pain. They all say, I cannot breathe. 
and you might get a child with fever, you might get an unconscious patient. So the presentations are undifferentiated. Amongst these, you might have the immediate life-threatening conditions, and amongst them, you might have patients who can be reassured and sent home. We have a wide variety of age presentation to emergency departments, from the day zero baby to the 96-year-old geriatric patient. They all come through our door, and we have to relate and manage them accordingly. Our patients don't come with a label on their head saying acute coronary syndrome. Most patients have comorbid conditions and at times multiple comorbidities. And it is up to us to work out where would this patient really need to go to for ongoing care and the most specific specialty that the patient would benefit most. We are in the true nature, we are multi-speciality competent in skills and knowledge. We are really the jacks of all trade, but in the second part of the phrase, I wouldn't agree. We definitely are the masters of our specialty, emergency medicine. So we attend to time critical conditions. Is it septic shock? And we initiate the bundle. If it is acute chondry syndrome and it is an occlusive myocardial infarction, we consider reperfusion therapy. If it is a ischemic stroke, we see the suitability for thrombolysis. And if it is a threatened ischemic limb, we initiate and we contact the most important people to manage it. We do initiate management in a great sense. We can do baseline investigations. We can do even more sophisticated investigations that whose turnaround time might be longer so the patient will get the reports in due course while ongoing care continues in a ward. We do initiate certain life-threatening conditions that need time critical management. Uh, we use point of care services such as ultrasonography, thromboelastometry. We actually can do imaging that is going to make a difference in the ongoing care through the emergency department. And we have a skill set to manage time critical life-threatening conditions such as intubation, intubating the critically ill patient, and even central venous access, just tube drainage, and so on and so forth. So how do we ensure patient-centered care? We have a design concept in emergency departments that sort out this area into specific parts, and this helps us to give the best care to our patients. And it all starts through what is called triage. And it is generally nurse-driven triage that is most beneficial. And we can conform to this even in Sri Lankan's context. And most of my colleagues who are now managing busy departments do actually resort to this triage system. It tells us where the patient is going to be seen, how fast, and what the patient needs immediately. So there is a sorting system that works. We manage multiple trauma. We, our approach is team-based. We bring out the best in our team members. We are confident, we are empathetic, we are good communicators, and we do the best for the patient in front of us. And some of the areas in our departments, the acute care area where we, we can provide stabilization that can take a little lo longer and find out a disposition plan for the patient to the most suitable area in our hospital. We have fast track where we sort out the patient's problems then and there, and then we can discharge them out within a very short period of time. You got a happy patient, an unhappy patient who came through our door goes very happy. And sometimes we need to keep our patients a little longer, uh, maybe about 18 hours or 20 hours. So we need a small space called a short stay unit where we are sure that our patients are safe to be trans transferred out of our department. Disposition is really the second most important part of our game plan. We want patient flow through our department. We want to see more and more patients coming through our door. So which means we need to send them out our department to the most appropriate parts. So we are the champions of disposition decisions. Is it intensive care? Is it operating theater? It is the inward medical care or do we actually need to escalate and provide tertiary care beyond our means and, and retrieve this patient to a higher center? And very often, majority of the patients need just reassurance uh, and some simple kind of advice and off they go home for a follow-up with their the general practitioner. So 
finally, it is really a question of increasing the efficiency of healthcare services. We want to smoothen the patient flow through our busy hospitals and overcrowded wards. We want our patients to receive the best care. We are great at risk stratifying and we employ clinical decision rules to come at the most appropriate decision that will be benefiting the patient. We work as a team that includes our own department as well as all our colleagues whom we want to work with together to improve standards of patient care and efficiency. We will offload wards in wards in patient admissions. We do simple procedures under procedure sedation and we definitely choose the most appropriate disposition plan for our patients. And we are hell bent on improving uh, and making a difference to clinical audits research and revalidation of our, uh, our skills so that this speciality is going to add to the, uh, the, the landscape of Sri Lankan medicine in the future. So in summary, emergency medicine is a new specialty. We are just three years old. We are having the Herlequin task of transforming these different types of emergency units into composite emergency departments. We are keen and we are focused to, pro uh, to provide patient-centered care and ultimately our goal is to improve the efficiency of healthcare services. Thank you very much. So it is indeed a pleasure now to get on to the, the business end of this symposium. And um, we have three distinguished uh, emergency physicians. Uh, my dear colleagues uh, sitting right next to me is Dr. Anusha Banwala. She is an emergency physician at uh, the teaching hospital Ratnapura. Next to her is Madhurangi Arya Singh. She's the emergency physician at a very busy urban uh, hospital, base hospital, Panadura. And right at the end is my dear colleague who unfortunately dropped her. She was the only rose in, amongst the thorns in our first batch, but then she was so selfless. She gave up her position in our batch and accompanied her husband for his foreign training. And that is uh, Manohari Dianage, and she is the uh, emergency physician at District General Hospital Nikambo. So over to you, ladies. Thank you very much, Dr. Harendu. That's a very kind introduction. I highly appreciate the way you introduce uh, emergency department, which is our working environment. And also you paved the way to our talk today. So I'm Manohari. And three of us are very excited to talk to you about the way we piece it, the puzzle together to manage a critically ill patient in emergency department. So let me take you through the story of Mr. Fernando. Mr. Fernando admitted to an emergency treatment unit of a base hospital in the one gloomy afternoon around 5 p.m. He's a 50-year-old gentleman with past history of diabetes, mellitus, and heavy smoking, coming with a sudden onset giddiness. On admission, his observations were unremarkable other than the, his appearance. He looked pale and sweaty. Five minutes later, started complaining of chest discomfort and appearance looked more gray with a heart rate of 110 and blood pressure of 90 by 60. At this point, he was triaged to category two and taken to a resuscitation bed and given oxygen via non the mask. And IV access was obtained with two large vocabulary and blood was sent for investigations, including a troponin I and ECG was requested. Within next couple of minutes, Mr. Fernando deteriorated further. He became tachypnic, tachycardic, and his blood pressure dropped to 80 by 40. He developed bilateral lower zone crackles on auscultation and saturation dropped to 92 while he's on oxygen. Anusha, our friend Mr. Fernando is obviously in shock. When you were presented with a patient like these clinical parameters, how would you differentiate the shock? Uh, 
um, ES one or him. So that's a good question. So obviously, uh, this is a critically ill patient in our department. So as you correctly said, he is in shock. And uh, I have a few differential diagnosis in back of my head for this patient's shock. But at the moment, I'm not quite 100% sure what's going on or what's the reason for this man's shock. So that brings us to the topic of approaching to an undifferentiated shock patient in our emergency department. So just to start you with the basics, so shock is an inadequate tissue oxygen supply to meet the demands. And then um, what's most important is it is a pathophysiological condition rather than a diagnosis. Shock can result in different pathophysiologies, and it can be the final common pathway prior to death in most of the cases. So if we don't treat it on time, if we don't recognize it on time, it can lead to multi-organ failure and death. And on the other hand, if we diagnose shock early and treat it promptly, we can save those lives. So what is undifferentiated shock in the emergency department? So patients in shock, we sometimes they present with the obvious cause to us, but sometimes they may not have an obvious cause for their shock. So they are obviously hemodynamically unstable, maybe in a periodic situation as well, but we don't know the reason behind. So what's most important is to suspect shock early and detect that the patient is in shock. And then with, with that, hand in hand, we have to start to resuscitate this patient. And then while resuscitating and doing the assessment, we have to understand what is the clinical subtype of shock and then start the specific management for this patient. So these are the clinical signs that will help us to uh, identify that a patient is in shock. As you all know, the hemodynamics, the classics we expect in a patient with shock includes this hypertension and tachycardia and all these things. But on the other hand, we also should know that a patient with bradycardia can also be in shock, especially if they're having a cardiac arrhythmia. The cardiac output is directly dependent on the heart rate, so they can be in shock as well. Another important thing is elevated shock index, um, which I will briefly explain. Shock index is heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure, which is a very good indicator to describe the tachycardia in context of the blood pressure. So if it's more than 0.8, that indicates that the patient is significantly unstable and there is possibility of shock. Uh, other than this hemodynamics, uh, a low urine output, which is a good indicator of renal hypoperfusion, and these cold peripheries and mottling, which is again an indicator of skin hypoperfusion, are good signs indicating shock as well. We all know about these anaphylaxis features like urticaria and geoedema and flushing. And then again, if the patient is having a new onset delirium, we can think of shock as the cause for that as well. So these, if present more than one, can be an indicator of presence of shock in the patient. So this is something that we all know, but just to brief you out, what are the causes of shock and what are the clinical subtypes of shock? So we all know heart is the pump that um, sends out blood to all the peripheral tissues. So what happens if the heart fails? So that is what we call cardiogenic shock. This can happen in various ways. One is uh, like, for example, myocardial infarction with a failing heart can cause a cardiogenic shock. On the other hand, it can be due to arrhythmia. So that's failing pump causing cardiogenic shock. The other thing is obstructive shock. The mechanism is different. There is an obstruction to the blood flow outside the heart. Examples include, as we all know, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and pulmonary embolism. Distributive shock has a different mechanism. It's something to do with the vessel function. So vessel function is poor, vessels are dilated, and the peripheral vascular resistance is low, which in case, in the other hand, causes poor peripheral circulation. Examples include, including um, septic shock, neurogenic shock, and anaphylactic shock. Hypovolemic shock is another common presentation to our departments, which is, of course, due to absolute uh, reduction in fluid volume within the vasculature. 
can be of two types. Hemorrhagic shock is one kind where there is obvious bleeding. So bleeding can be, for example, in a trauma or in non-traumatic conditions like GI bleeds in patients. So there are other kinds like non-hemorrhagic shocks causing hypovolemic shock. These include fluid losses, including diarrhea and vomiting and burns. So how can we approach to a patient with undifferentiated shock? There are a few steps, but we know we are dealing with a critically ill patient and there's no time to go by step by step. We can't wait for the history to be completed and then assess the patient. We have to do everything together. That's the most important thing. So while we are assessing the patient, we, yes, we take a history. Our history is not a very long history. We take a targeted history to fit into the patient's presentation and to fit into our suspected diagnosis. For example, if, if we suspect the patient to have a cardiogenic shock, we take a relevant history, patient's presentation with any signs of cardiac illnesses, past history of cardiac diseases, risk factors to cardiac diseases, and any past history of recent investigations like 2 deco that would be important in a patient that we suspect a cardiogenic shock. On the other hand, it's different if we suspect something like anaphylactic shock, we definitely ask whether there's an exposure to a triggering thing. Then we do our physical examination, starting with our ABC with primary survey. We assess the patient's airway, whether they can maintain the airway by their own, and how is the oxygenation of the patient, whether we need to give oxygen or any other modes of ventilation for this patient. So while we're doing primary assessment as well, we might sometimes detect the patient's cause for shock. For example, while we are doing this um, breathing assessment, we might see clinical signs suggestive of a tension pneumothorax. So at the same time, while we detect that, we can correct those things as well. So going into circulation part, while we are assessing the circulation with patients' hemodynamic parameters, we definitely get IV access to these patients and start IV fluids as an initiating measure. Then we do our secondary survey after that, from head to toe. I'm not going to tell you everything in detail, but it's something we all know. So what are these investigations that we can do in our departments to these patients in shock? Yes, while we take the IV access, uh, we can take blood for most of the investigations, but in our department, while we are resuscitating these patients, we get results of only a very few investigations. One is a VBG, and um, we, we find a lot of things from our VBGs. Lactate is one thing, uh, which is an indicator of patients, uh, patients going to be bad or patients going to be deteriorating soon. So if lactate is high, that, that is a sort of an indicator for peripheral hypoperfusion. And we can get uh, indication of changes in electrolytes from the VBG as well. And then ECG, if we suspect patient to have something uh, bad with their cardiac problems. Um, for example, we can detect ST elevation, myocardial infarctions, arrhythmias with our ECGs. Not to forget bedside ultrasound scan. We all emergency doctors in our departments, we are, we are trained and we know how to use the ultrasound scan to detect the cause of the shock at the bedside, which is a very, very useful tool for us all in our departments. So after this initial assessment, and the initial set of investigations, we definitely can come into a conclusion or a highly suspect cause for this shock. And then we should start the initial specific therapy for these patients. So if we find that the patient is in a cardiogenic shock, for example, due to ST elevation MI, so we have to go ahead with the specific therapy of free vascularization. If it's an arrhythmia, we have to treat the arrhythmia. And then if it's a hypovolemic shock due to bleeding, we have to start blood start giving blood as soon as possible, as well as that, we have to uh, do measures to stop for the bleeding. So those are the options of uh, initiating specific therapy. I think that's a basic introduction on approaching to a patient with undifferentiated shock. That is an excellent description about shock, Anusha. And you also brought up an important topic, which is bedside ultrasound. Madhurangi, how would you use point of care ultrasound to differentiate pathologies in a critically ill patient and identify cause of shock. Yes, Manohari. 
point of care ultrasound scan is a rapidly expanding uh, diagnostic and therapeutic modality uh, in emergency departments and ICUs. Uh, but what exactly meant by uh, point of care ultrasound scan? It is actually performed uh, and interpreted by a clinician who has the best knowledge uh, about the patient at the bedside and interrogate the results of the focus immediately into a management plan. Many studies have shown that initial interrogation of focus answers specific clinical questions that narrow differentials, guide clinical therapy, and direct consultations and disposition. Then it is not difficult to understand the role of focus in, as an invaluable tool in an approaching for an undifferentiated hypotension. In order to make it easier, we have a systematic approach uh, for a shock. So by developing various protocols, including eFAST, brush, and false protocols. I think almost all of you have heard of eFAST, which we use in um, uh, trauma resuscitation. And a uh, few words about the rush and the false protocol. False protocol means it is a fluid administration limited by lung sonography. So the name itself implies that it's based on lung scan and as well as echocardiography. Rush exam protocol, it is a rapid assessment uh, using the ultrasound scan in shock and hypotension. There is a sort of a systematic approach uh, with the, uh, using uh, major, parts of the, uh, major parts of the body, uh, what we call mnemonic HIMAP. So, we are moving now from evidence-based medicine to the personalized medicine. Applying the same theory here, it is better to adjust your protocols according to the patient in front of you by using protocols as just only a guide. So in case of Mr. Fernandez's condition, so we decided to initiate the initial assessment of uh, Mr. Fernandez's condition by using bedside echo. Use of point of care echo is an acute care setting can be used as a diagnostic as well as a monitoring tool. There are basically four views, parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis, four apical four chamber view and subcostal view. So basically we are worrying about, we are looking for regional wall motion defect as we uh, look at, can be seen in the diagram. So if there's any sort of a regional wall motion defect uh, in terms that we can interpret that there's maybe a culprit vessel. So in even before the ECG comes, we can diagnose the condition in acute coronary syndrome. As well as we are looking for right ventricular function, especially in the pulmonary embolism and the pericardial effusion. And should not forget about to assess the aortic root that can be clearly visualized in the uh, parasternal long axis and uh, valvular dysfunction, especially in the acute valvular dysfunction. Stepping more of advancing uh, this point of care echo, now we can assess cardiac output at the bedside by using LVOT VTI. This is kind of a new concept. We know that the assessment of cardiac output is a bit of a complex procedure a few years back, but now with the uh, in evolving of this point of care echo, um, we can assess as a, uh, within very few uh, seconds. Uh, this is actually a doctor study, which we assess in stroke volume, then we can turn it into the cardiac output. So IVC, since the beginning of using ultrasound scan in critical care settings, IVC plays an important role in assessing intravascular fluid status or fluid responsiveness. IVC diameter and the collapsible index are the two indicators we can use. But perhaps you have known that uh, dilated IVC more than two centimeters, or if the collapsibility index is less than 50%, it means that the patient's having adequate intravascular volume. But it's not exactly representing the intravascular fluid status if the patient's having underlying cardiovascular instability specifically if the patients have in heart failure. So we now step in further by interrogating this right ventricular view and the lung scan with IVC. So for an accurate assessment of fluid status. All right, so 
recapping how important the focus in identifying the pathology behind undifferentiated shock, these are a few examples. Cardiac tamponade, which result in obstructive shock. Free fluid in abdomen, in hemorrhagic shock, in trauma, or sometimes now common in dengue shock syndrome. And aortic dissection, aortic rupture, which should not be forget in elderly who are coming with shock. So moving to Mr. Fernando's bedside assessment, which shows dramatic reduction of ejection fraction. You can see that's in the three views and uh, which shows anteroceptor anteroceptor segment is dyskinetic and uh, bilateral lung shows bilateral B profile. So before that's, this was actually happened within 10 minutes of the presentation. So even before the ECG arrived, we diagnosed these patients having a cardiogenic shock with LVF, probably due to anteroceptal MI. Okay, so now, um, so we have already done the point of care ultrasound, and we could also arrange the ECG for this patient within eight to 10 minutes of arrival to emergency department. So just to tell you about the ECG, so this is an ECG in sinus rhythm with a heart rate around 100 beats per minute. And I can see obviously there are ST elevations involving anterior leads and some reciprocal changes in inferior leads as well. So I think what's going on is a anterior ST elevation myocardial infarction. So Madurangi, uh, how can we manage this patient with anterior ST elevation in my in our department. Do we have any special protocols or criteria to manage these patients? Yes, Anusha. Unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, acute coronary syndrome is one of the commonest presentation uh, to the a &E unit. And uh, reperfusion strategies uh, in uh, STEMI uh, has updated a lot, uh, by st uh, but selecting the best method is important. Generally, primary PCI is preferred to thrombolysis if it can be delivered within two hours of first medical contact. Thrombolysis is preferred if expected first medical contact to balloon time is more than two hours. As in Mr. Fernando's situation, it's not an easy task to refer a patient uh, from a peripheral unit to a PCI-capable centers for PCI because of huge demand and uh, competition. So, uh, but due to wide availability of uh, tenant place in most of our emergency departments, we could have to save uh, patients and uh, reduce the mortality significantly. So uh, this patient, actually we started with tenant place and uh, then we can decide on whether this patient need a rescue PCI or not, if the patient's not responding or the preperfusion is not achieved. Okay, so now, now we have got a few um, clues identified. So patient is having a ST elevation myocardial infarction and then point of care ultrasound uh, showed us evidences of regional wall motion defects. And now we know patient is in a cardiogenic shock due to this ST elevation MI. So there's another problem going on or a question in my mind. Uh, so we know that the patient is in critically ill situation with STEMI and he needs a thrombolysis. So can we just straight away go ahead with thrombolysis or do we need to take patient in our decision-making? How we can decide that Manohari? So Anusha, we know in acute coronary syndrome and ST elevation MI, the time is muscle. But saying that, we should not forget the patient in front of us. So the patient in front of us, us has his own autonomy, and we have to respect that autonomy as doctors. So getting the patient involved in decision-making is a task done followed, following a dish assessment of decisional capacity. So decisional capacity has four components. So ability to patient's ability to understand information related to the treatment decision and patient's ability to appreciate the significance of information given, and ability to weigh the treatment options with reasoning, and ability to express the choice. Even though we know what is best for patient, we should not impose our treatment on patient. So what we should do is facilitate that decision making. So we should always ask open-ended questions when, when we are facilitating that decision making. 
So for an example, we can check the patient's understanding by asking, what brought you to eat it today, Mr. Fernando? Likewise, so it is always to, uh, important to assess the decision-making capacity and also getting the patient involved in decision-making. Now we have this patient's BBG at our hand, Madurangi. How would you describe this VBG? Yes, Manahari. So we know that uh, we have a, some sort of idea about Mr. Fernando's condition that he's having cardiogenic shock, secondary STEMI. Um, so uh, the VBG shows uh, there's a significant metabolic acidosis, with, which is actually high on ANGA met metabolic acidosis with an ANGA more than 20 and with lactate of 4. And uh, blood sugar level is 235, 235. We know that Mr. Fernando is a patient who's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and on oral hypoglycemic drugs. So, Manhari, could there be more than one pathology for metabolic acidosis in this patient? Yes, Madurangi. We know our patient is in cardiogenic shock. Yes, the answer is yes, of course. This patient could have more than one pathology for his metabolic acidosis because he is on or he's a known patient with diabetes and on oral hypoglycemic medication. I don't know why these people use these tongue twisting words for new medications. Our friend is on a sodium glucose uh, co-transporter to inhibitor, which is empagliflozin, and he's on 25 milligrams of that. So we know, even though it's rare, he, patients on this medication can develop euglycemic BKA, especially when they are having an acute illness. So what is euglycemic BKA? It is diabetic ketoacidosis without hyperglycemia. There are three diagnostic criteria. The serum glucose is less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. The cutoff might be slight, there might be slight variation in uh, cutoff in various papers, but roughly it is around 200 milligrams per deciliter. And with a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and a ketonemia. And in our setup, we don't always have facilities to measure ket serum ketone levels, blood ketone levels, so we can go for ketone urine. And there are facilitating factors, acute illness, such as infection, and like Mr. Fernando, myocardial infarction, any fasting, sta fasting status, like in uh, so for surgical procedures or any uh, other con associated with any other condition or a chronic illness, or if the patient is abusing any medications or if the patient is pregnant. So symptoms and signs are just like the diabetic ketoacidosis and the management is always sim almost similar to diabetic ketoacidosis. Euglycemic ketoacidosis is not a new entity. It was described in 1973 by Munro et al. So mechanism of, so of sodium glucose cause transported to inhibitor in causing ketoacidosis in diabetic patient is due to its ability to reduce serum glucose. That induces lipolysis and free fatty acid formation leading to ketone production and then euglycemic BKA. So management, like I told earlier, the management is almost similar to diabetic ketoacidosis, except that we in, commence dextrose infusions early in the treatment process because patient mm -hmm. is having almost normal glycemia and we should prevent patient developing hypoglycemia. So adequate hydration, looking at the hemodynamic status of the patient and the metabolic status and insulin infusion commencement with targeting normal glycemia, normal pH and normal anion gap and dextrose infusion early in the treatment and uh, replacing the potassium if indicated while monitoring the serum potassium closely. So euglycemic BK is a rare entity, yes, but every patient with diabetes, when we encounter a high anion gap metabolic acidosis, even the serum glucose is normal or near normal, we should consider euglycemic BK. Finally, we believe that uh, we found what exactly Mr. Fernando is having. 
So it's having cardiogenic shock with LVF, uh, secondary anterior STEMI, Kilip score of four, and euglycemic DK, which was uh, later confirmed by presence of purine ketone bodies, more than three plus. So the patient was treated with IV tenecteplase, 40 milligram, which was started at around 5.15 p.m. Then uh, he was treated with IV insulin infusion with dextrose uh, for DK. And uh, as we know that patient on card uh, cardiogenic shock, so to maintain the map around 60 millimeters of mercury, we started uh, him on IV noradrenaline, 0.1 mic per kg per minute and titrated the doses. And uh, we know that this patient's having LVF, left ventricular failure, and was in his desperate distress, so started on uh, CPAP with eight uh, centimeters of water. But crisis is not yet over. Half an hour of post-thrombolysis. We noted that there was a wide QRS complexes with heart rate of 90 per minute on the ECG. Shortly after that, rate increased to 200 per minute on the cardiac monitor. Anusha, we all know that early phase of myocardial infarction is vulnerable for arrhythmias. My question to you is that considering Mr. Fernando's uh, most thrombolysis rhythms, is this is a reperfusion arrhythmia which doesn't require any treatment or something that we should take as seriously and treat promptly? Okay, so I can say yes and no for your questions. Um, so if you, that brings me to a discussion. This, if you see both of them, they, they have some similarities and some differences. They're both broad complex tachycardias. So they're both regular, but the first one is rated around 100 and the second one is rated around 200. So about post MI arrhythmias, I'll start with the first one. So that's called the accelerated idioventricularism, which happens when the rate of an ectopic pacemaker exceeds that of the sinus node. And it's a benign rhythm, self-limiting. We usually see it in a post-thrombolistic patient. To describe you the ECG features or the features in that rhythm, it's, as I said, and as you showed me on that previous picture, it's a regular rhythm, broad complexes, but the rate is between 50 to 110 usually. But if the rate exceeds that, we have to think of a ventricular tachycardia. There can be fusion and capture beats as well. So having three or more ventricular complexes at a stretch, we can think of an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. So most common cause, as in our patient, is the reperfusion phase of acute myocardial infarction. It doesn't need any treatment. It usually is self-limiting. What we have to do is to make sure that the patient's uh, myocardial perfusion is restored appropriately. So to tell about post-MI arrhythmias, it can be of different kinds. We can see heart blocks. We can see some atrial, uh, like atrial arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillations, atrial flutters, and ventricular arrhythmias, maybe ventricular tachycardias or fibrillations. So what's important is, uh, if we see a ventricular tachyarrhythmia, we usually see it in early phase of ischemia. And we all have to know, if a patient with an acute myocardial infarction is having a ventricular arrhythmia, that is an indicator that the patient is in a significantly high mortality risk. Right, as we correctly identified, it was a ventricular tachycardia with pulse. So, um, Mr. Fernando developed a sustained ventricular tachycardia. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, initially it was treated with uh, uh, 200 joules uh, synchronized cardioversion but it required two cycles. And since it was resistant, uh, we had to start IV amiodarone 300 milligram bolus. I know this is not much common, but isn't this something unusual, Anusha? Yes, so which brings me to the topic of uh, significantly deteriorating patient with uh, arrhythmias. And then we'll discuss about cardiac electric storm. I think that's a similar situation like a cardiac electrical storm. So what is a cardiac electrical storm? We all should know it's a period of cardiac electrical instability having at least three or more than that distinct episodes of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, or if the patient is on an ICD, 
more than three shocks within a 24 hours period. So as in our patient, the precipitant can be cardiac ischemia, which is the most common one. But on the other hand, electrolyte abnormalities, thyrotoxicosis, heart failure, those things can be triggering uh, precipitants as well. So it's a vicious cycle actually. Uh, what happens or what is underlying is elevated sympathetic tone. When the heart is vulnerable or when the heart is having myocardial infarction and myocardial damage, and also patient is in pain, it induces a lot of sympathetic activity, which causes this arrhythmia. So when we are treating the arrhythmia with shocks and all those uh, cardiac uh, massages or anything like that, it again induces further myocardial damage, and this goes on as a vicious cycle. So our target of management should be aiming at uh, treating or stopping this elevated sympathetic tone. That's what we are doing in managing an electrical storm. So as we all know, we start management in these patients uh, in a similar way to our advanced cardiac life support and in very much similar to other ventricular tachyarrhythmias. We all know if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we go with the basic principles of advanced cardiac life support. If it's unstable ventricular fibrillation, definitely we go for defibrillation. So if it's a ventricular tachycardia, which is stable, there are few things different that we can do. So polymorphic ventricular tachycardias and monomorphic ventricular tachycardias. The first one I have shown in the picture is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And the second one is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardias, they are more likely to get deteriorated easily and they are likely to need further electrical cardioversions. While in monomorphic ventricular tachycardias, we can think of drug medications to uh, stop this electrical storm. The first thing is, amiodarone is well recognized as a important medication or antiarrhythmic in treating these patients. So we have few options of medications. We start with amiodarone as antiarrhythmic, amiodarone bolus followed by infusion. Then if it's not responding, we can think of other drugs like lignocaine. And also there is the importance of beta blockers in stopping sympathetic uh, response in these scenarios has been well identified and is being used for treatment. Propanolol is found to be very useful, IV propanolol, to reduce sympathetic output and treat electrical storms. Then what's very important is to treat the underlying cause. As I said, the most common cause is cardiac ischemia. We have to do adequate measures to uh, revascularize uh, and uh, stop cardiac ischemia. If the problem is electrolyte abnormalities, we have to definitely correct that. Pension, because we all have to know about overdrive pacing. It's another option that we can use in these patients with electrical storm. So what we do is, it's similar, the procedure is almost similar to this uh, temporary pacing method that we use in our departments. So we pace the heart at a higher rate than the normal heart rate. That's a temporary stabil stabilization method. And with that, we usually can decrease the mortality in resistant arrhythmias until we get the proper treatment to the patient with this morbid tachyarrhythmia. So as already discussed, Mr. Fernando was cardioverted twice. Madurangi, is there any way we could facilitate this cardioversion? Can we make the patient comfortable during cardioversion? Yes, Manohar, definitely. Cardioversion is not an appropriate pleasant experience to uh, patients, especially like in patients with acute Conrad syndrome. And there are many uh, painful procedures we are doing day to day in the emergency settings. And we know that's how it's difficult uh, to tolerate that, those sort of procedures. So we need something uh, to alleviate this pain and anxiety. So what we are going to talk about is a procedural sedation. Procedure sedation is refers to use of analgesics, analytics, and dissociative agents to perform urgent, painful, and emotional challenging procedures. It is done by uh, emergency physicians in the emergency department uh, in a resuscitation bay. So, it main key role of uh, this procedure sedation 
is to minimize adverse psychological response to pain. So there are three basic things we have to consider in procedural sedation. We have to have a, a good checklist of what actually we are going to do and whether this patient is eligible for the procedural sedation. Second, we should have to uh, back up with all the resuscitative equipments and going with the continuous monitoring uh, to uh, early and prompt uh, management of complications which can occur during the procedural sedation. And then we have to think about the medication, what we are going to select for a particular patient. So what exactly this procedural sedation is, it is not the minimal sedation, but we are giving anxiolytics to calm down the patient. And it is also not uh, general anesthesia where we give lots of sedative drugs uh, that patient is in an unarousable state. So we are going in a middle pathway. That is what we call conscious sedation. So what is conscious sedation is that we are giving the uh, medication to keep the patient in a sedative state where the patient can do purposeful response to verbal or a simple tactile stimulation. And the next important thing is that we don't do, want to do any intervention to maintain the airway and the spontaneous ventilation and the cardiovascular function. So I talked about this pro, uh, checklist. We know that in emergency department, it's really chaotic environment where we manage all the emergencies in a bit of a structured and organized way. For that, we usually use checklist. So like in other situations, the procedure sedation, we are basically concerned about uh, whether this patient, first thing is whether we can get the informed consent for the procedure. If the patient is agreed for the procedure, yes, we can go ahead with the procedure. And then we have to see that's whether the patient is eligible for the procedure sedation. So as an example, ASA grading. And then we have to look whether this patient's having any problems in airway, whether there's an anticipated difficult airway features are there. Because during the procedure, if the complication arise, we may have to intubate the patient, and then we have to uh, prepare for this difficult airway. And then we have to back up all the equipments uh, and uh, decide on about the medications. So medications wisely, we know lots of medications we are using in the emergency department. Those actually we are using in the theaters as well. But in the procedure sedation, the most important thing is not the medication type, not the type of the root of the medication. It is the dose of the medication. So remember that as example, the ketamine, we know that ketamine is a one of a good medication which can maintain the hemodynamic state. So if the patient is having a cardiogenic shock, just like in our patient, we can use ketamine, but it depends on the dose. Even in the large doses of ketamine can compromise the cardiovascular state. So always we have to think about the sedation. So just think about doses of the sedation. Just think about the patient in front of you and tailor made and adjust the doses as per patient but not exactly what we are seeing in the guidelines. So Mr. Fernando got IV fentanyl 50 microgram and IV ketamine 30 milligram. Since the Mr. Fernando was having a cardiogenic shock and with a compromised heart, we gave slow, uh, titrated, low volume of doses and uh, then it was followed by synchronized cardioversion. So we knew that this patient uh, is in anterior STEMI uh, and uh, patients in a cardiogenic shock. And we thought that patient need a, a referral to a PCI capable center. So mm -hmm. we referred the patient for a PCI capable center for the further management by 6.45 p.m. Okay, so that was a critical patient that we received and we could manage. He was in cardiogenic shock and a STEMI. We could do the all necessary initial management, and then the patient is stabilized to be transferred to the uh, further treatment in a different specialty. So now we are thinking of uh, what are the special methods or what are the things that we can do um, in this position of a patient? Are there any special things that we have to do? And what are the things that we have to remember or things we have to consider in referring a patient from our department into another specialty? What do you think, Manohari? Can we discuss on that? 
Yes, Anusha. Now we are coming to a very important part of our discussion and patient management as well. So how are we going to plan the disposition of this patient? So disposition planning needs a lot of consideration. There are two arms of disposition. Are we going to admit this patient under a medical team, under a treating team, or are we going to discharge this patient? So good, good, a good clinician would start thinking about this disposition from the first moment he sees the patient. So if planned early, this would facilitate uh, patient satisfaction, improve patient, patient satisfaction, and save many hours of health staff and patient, and also save resources and improve patient flow in your department. This portion is always facilitated by effective communication with the referring clinician. There are several factors affecting this position. So these are the patient factors. So whether the patient have access to follow-up healthcare, whether the patient is able to fill up the medication prescriptions, how independent is the patient in the community, and what is his capacity to perform activities of daily living? And does the patient have family support or a support social network? And is there any risk for patient to go home? So as ED clinicians, we always make referrals. So we love referrals. But referring a patient to a different clinical team is an art and a skill you should master. So what are the rules of referring a patient? Be nice and polite. Don't get angry. There's nothing personal in a referral. So referral is a two educated people discussing a patient among themselves to decide the better out, best outcome for the patient. So there's nothing personal in a referral. So treat others as they would like to be treated. Be soft on the people, but hard on the issues. Grace, learn to grace under pressure. Never get into an argument about the patient. Focus on the discussion. Focus the discussion on what is best for your patient. So it's good practice to try to understand your receiver. So what does your receiver need? Is he asking for bare facts? Or does he need all the social circumstances of the patient? Does he need the details of all the investigation? Or are they interested in emotional and social background of the patient? Depending on your patient's, on your receiver's necessity, you should cater the amount of information you're giving. And there are different approaches and drawbacks of referring a patient. So few, I've, I've mentioned few approaches here. The first one is forcing. So if you ask someone over the phone, you will come down to ED now. So that destroys the relationship. And if you are smoothing your referral, seeing that the other person is resistant, like saying, okay, sorry, I'll try to talk to another consultant. So what would that do? That would preserve the relationship in, between both of you, but would not bring uh, anything to the task at hand. And if you're avoiding a diff uh, difficult referral, saying, can you just come down to ED and then, then hang up? That will destroy the relationship permanently and you can't refer a person, a patient to that clinician again. And if you agree to compromise, saying, okay, we'll wait for another hour, then we'll call you back in an hour that preserve the relationship partly, but is not going to bring anything to your patient. The best approach is the confronting method. So you tell the referring clinician that send someone from his team to see the patient now at this moment, and you will get the things ready for him to see the patient when he is coming down in a half an hour. So that is the best approach that preserves the relationship and achieves the task at hand. But unfortunately, this is not possible always. So 
can you remember the last time when you order a meal at a drive through so what would you do you check out the menu before you are ordering you check what is the every facts about the situation and talk to everyone in the car to find out what they want that's what we do so what are we going to do so we are going to talk to every person involved in the patient management in our emergency department and gather facts about the patient and gather their concerns and get your money ready what is your money here so it is the details about the clinical patient's presentation and the available investigations have all the paperwork ready at your hand and then place your order so you're placing your order not asking for the chef special so tell exactly what you want and be assertive about your requirement so there are various approaches of referring a patient one is well known ispa and this is a different approach it's 5c approach we call it so it consists of contact communicate co question collaborate and closing the loop so contact tell who you are and where are you calling from and introduce you by your name and check whether you are talking to the correct person and communicate tell them what you want from them tell them important negative findings and positive findings tell the details in brief and co question so what is the purpose of this referral explain that clearly to the receiving consultant or the clinician and collaborate agree on what you want from both sides like if you if the receiving consultant is wanting you to if the receiving consultant is asking you to order a ct for this patient if you think that is appropriate for the patient and it is not delaying further the uh, treatment of the for if, if it is not delaying the treatment of this patient further so you can agree on that investigation and then most importantly closing the loop make sure both of you are on the same page summarize the uh, outcome and mention you you should know when they are going to come and review the patient the exact time and if someone asks me okay now you are telling this is the things we should consider when you are re uh, referring a patient so how would you refer this patient to a clinician so i would refer this patient to the cardiology unit the nearest uh, cardi interventional cardiology unit so this is my approach hello this is manohari i'm an emergency physician from base hospital panadura am i talking to dr madurangi the consultant cardiologist at nhsl dr madurangi i would refer i would like to refer mr fernando to you for rescue pci and for an icu bed this is a 50 year old male admitted with an anterior st elevation mi complicated with cardiogenic shock and euglycemic dka he is a heavy smoker with type history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and for post thrombolysis he developed a vt storm which was managed with the electrical cardioversion and amiodarone infusion he has ongoing chest pain and ecg shows poor ref perfusion at the moment he is on noradrenaline amiodarone and insulin infusions his hemodynamics are stable with the blood pressure of 100 by 80 heart rate of 100 and a saturation of 96 on a cpap we are trying to wean off the cpap mr fernando needs a rescue pci and an icu bed i would really appreciate if you can offer these to us i'm very happy to answer any questions if you have regarding this patient thank you very much so our referral was successful cardiology logist at the cardiology center happy to was happy to take over our patient so by about 7 o'clock we managed to load our patient to the ambulance destined to go to national cardiology unit of national hospital of sri lanka so we saw a full moon in the eastern sky 
and patient following rescue patient rescue PCI, our friend Mr. Fernando had had a satisfactory outcome. All right. So Mr. Fernando was very challenging patient. This was not a hypothetical case. This was a real patient who presented to the emergency unit in peripheral hospital. And it's not a surprise that we can see uh, these kind of challenges, these kind of patients every day and uh, in emergency units. But remember, the emergencies are not only happens in emergency units. It can happen everywhere. That's why we want to know uh, about how to manage undifferentiated, unscheduled patients. So in summary, we today we learned about shock, but remember there should be more than one pathology we should have to uh, exclude because rather, de rather than just going for a one cause or one reason for a shock. Point of care ultrasound is a bedside friend when managing undifferentiated patients, like in this case, it's hypotension. Acute MI uh, complicated with the arrhythmias are not much common, but if it is there, then it should be aggressively treated because it will determine the prognosis of the patient. Effective communication always improve patient outcome. Referring a patient just like ordering at a drive-through, you must be equipped with all the facts about the patient and you should have to approach in a pleasant and flexible way because you are referring the patient to your own colleagues. So that will protect ethics as our good doctors. So I think we have some time for uh, your questions to the panel. Um, we can start with some messages that we have got. So, right. Uh, it's about a noradrenaline. Uh, they have mentioned about whether they, we can have any other option other than the noradrenaline here, Anusha. For so, shock yeah. management. Okay. Um, so yes, noradrenaline is one of the basic uh, uh, agents that we use in managing a shock patient at early phase. Um, that's easy to be given in a peripheral line in a low dose. So we usually use, but there are options. I think Manohari, we can use other options, but I prefer to use noradrenaline in a patient with shock, especially if it's undifferentiated shock um, to start with, because it's an easier drug without much uh, side effects, which we can use with a peripheral cannula. What about the job you mm -hmm. Is there any place for that? Um, we do use job mm -hmm. of course, but uh, in this patient with cardiogenic shock, it has its own uh, side effects mm -hmm. and uh, uses as well. That all depends on its, we can't tell it for everyone, but depends on your patient. Mm -hmm. We can decide whether to use dobutamine or noradrenaline. I preferred noradrenaline in this patient, but with the cardiogenic shock, we can go ahead with dobutamine as well, I think. Yes, that's right. So um, there's one other question uh, about amiodron. Uh, so uh, the doctor is asking about whether we can start amiodron first without bolus. Uh, it, perhaps that means uh, starting infusion without giving a bolus. Mm -hmm. Is there any place for that, or is this the one we just do routinely practicing? So that's that's I think related to the ventricular storm or electrical storm. Yeah. So the practice or recommendation is usually to start the amiodron bolus, which the dose is 150 milligrams, which we give over 10 minutes duration. So in a patient with electrical shock, we we are like we have very short time left. Patient is in a critical ill state. And as I said, it, it's a vicious cycle. Myocardium is being damaged every cycle, we electrically cardio over the patient, and then it goes with increased sympathetic tone and further damage. So we have to stop this arrhythmia as soon as possible. So I think it's it's the best option is to start with the amiodron bolus of 150 milligram of 10 minutes. Then we can go for a lower dose infusion over like six hours and then reduce the dose uh, slowly. 
Yes, that's correct. So uh, always we have to start with our amiodarone boluses. So initially we started with 300 milligram over half an hour, but now it's reduced to 15, it's like 150 milligram because we know that there are some adverse outcome of the IV amiodarone, like uh, dropping the blood pressure, but it depends on the patient's conditions. This is a patient who already is having a cardiogenic shock. And uh, so we have to uh, revert the cause. So that is that was the arrhythmia. And uh, the infusion, it depends on that's how long that you are giving. That what was the traditional practice was uh, over 23 hours of 900 milligrams. And now they are just reducing doses and titrate according to the patient's outcome and the response to the drug. Uh, Manohari, uh, can we use a subcut route rather than IV route for insulin boluses during managing STEMI patients? Yes, not only STEMI, if any patient is critically ill, I would look at the other uh, metabolic, other uh, hemodynamics and the metabolic status of the patient, especially the blood gas. If the patient is in acidosis, especially high anion gap metabolic acidosis, I would suspect um, euglycemic DKA or a similar condition. Like euglycemic DKA itself is not associated only with sodium glucose co transporter 2 inhibitor. It's an entity which have identified in isolation with, uh, without that medication, but with other medical, other acute uh, illnesses. So I would start insulin infusion if the patient is critically ill so we can closely titrate the insulin and the blood sugar depending on high how the blood sugar is even if there's no uh, metabolic acidosis but if the patient is stable hemodynamically stable and metabolically stable and blood sugar is not that elevated or um, um, marginally elevated we can go from patients normal insulin regime even, or we can use subcut insulin. So it's a individual, whether the mode of insulin, whether it's IV or subcut depends on your patient and his condition. All right, Manohari. Uh, so yes, this is a condition where we talked about DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Remember, there's no place of subcut insulin for DKA during the acute uh, management uh, phase only after that patient's uh, ketoacidosis resolved on the via uh, transition to the subcutaneous um, route. Um, there's a one more question to Anusha. Does noradrenaline need external jugular vein or can we give via peripheral small vein? I think external jugular is also a peripheral vein, isn't it? So, yes, yes um, so ideally this drug should be given in central uh, line, but in our emergency, noradrenaline in our peripheral, uh, through our peripheral cannulas, we can give, but it, it's not for long-term uh, administration, for a short uh, duration until the patient is uh, stabilized and until we gain a central access for these inotropes or uh, vasoactive agents, we can use the peripheral line. Can I add something to that, Anusha? So, initially, there was a uh, dilemma saying noradrenaline should only be used with the central uh, venous access. But now that is gone, that um, concept is gone. Now there are emerging a lot of papers people have used, uh, which uh, assessing the, uh, comparatively assessing the side effects of uh, peripheral noradrenaline versus central noradrenaline. So they have identified, they have only very minimal side effects, almost equal side effects on either way. So initial worry was the uh, constriction of the peripheral vessels and the uh, formation of the gangrenes and stuff but now they know it's not there so that is a false concept so now people use peripheral noradrenaline uh, not in a small vein but a large vein like anti like anti-recubital for some veins is ideal with a large work cannula so you can go for peripheral noradrenaline up to 24 hours or just more than 24 hours so ed you don't have to rush to put a central venous line just for inotropes. So you can start inotropes with the peripheral large bow, uh, vein, large bow cannula with a large vein. All right. Um, so we'll go for another two more questions. Uh, uh, there's one uh, question about septic shock. Uh, uh, when there's an ordering maximum dose, 
and still the BP, if the BP is low, then what will be the next inotrope uh, we can start? Well, depends on the patient's condition. That's why we always assess in the bedside ultrasound scan. So see whether this patient's having a myocardial uh, dysfunction, they need to require inotrope. And we assess the cardiac output. Uh, the latest uh, approach is like uh, LVOT, VTI, so that uh, we can assess that and see that the patient need, uh, is having a, a good cardiac output. If it is there, then we have to go for the vasopressors. So if we need vasopressors, then the, the next option we can go with the vasopressin, and uh, which actually uh, can reduce the dose of noradrenaline. So, and the other thing is that uh, there is a place of starting uh, noradrenaline or vasopressors at the early phase of septic shock that gives a very good uh, prognosis. And uh, we go for a one more question about uh, PCI. So, um, not the PCI, this is about a tenective place. Uh, uh, describe the procedure and giving enoxaparin in a patient waiting PCI following tenective place. Well, this is actually two questions, I think, uh, because in a tenecti place, uh, what we are giving is like uh, giving IV bolus of uh, 30 milligram of enoxaparin uh, once we diagnose the STEMI and uh, followed by tenecti place according to the body weight of the patient. So uh, we have sort of a weight guidance in all emergency units. And then after 15 minutes, uh, we start subcut enoxaparin, that is one milligram per kg. But it depends on the age of the patient. If the patient is more than 75 years of age, then we avoid bolus uh, dose of IV and oxaparin because it's always risk because of the risk of uh, bleeding. And uh, that subcut dose of the enoxaparin will reduce to 0.75 milligram per kg. But remember, these are kind of a um, bit of a, uh, proven things, but you, these all are due to increased risk of bleeding. So, but we have managed patients, even with full doses without any problems, but it's better to follow the guidelines that's saying that's uh, to reduce this adverse outcome. Um, I think uh, that's all we have uh, in the Zoom platform, uh, right. So I think it's better to, uh, conclude this session. So um, I hope that today's panel discussion could have uh, bring you some important take home tips. Uh, and uh, this is very important that uh, assessing a patient uh, in undifferentiated conditions, uh, we should have to get an overall assessment of the patient. And the most important thing is that your clinical judgment. Emergency physicians are very, very much co uh, competent and very much uh, enthusiastic for concern on clinical judgment because we do have very little uh, amount of investigations and resources and facts when we are resuscitating the patient. So you can uh, have a good idea about this case. Uh, so I mentioned that this, is, this was not a hypothetical case. This was a patient exactly presented to our peripheral unit and the same scenario which we, with the patient had. And uh, so uh, that, that, that's the most important thing uh, uh, to have a good approach to a patient and should not rely on lots of investigations. We have bedside investigations. We basically focus on the VBG and the point of care ultrasound scan. We can uh, resolve lots of problems. So uh, I must appreciate uh, uh, the active participation of all the audience. And uh, for the questions that you have asked, I think uh, we have uh, uh, given your answers as much as possible. And uh, I should thank Sri Lanka Medical Association and uh, Madam Padma Gunaratna, the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, for inviting Sri Lanka College of Emergency Physicians uh, to have this valuable uh, discussion and that will make a, a good collaboration with the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So, uh, and also thank for the people who, the doctors who asked uh, about the questions and the, uh, the, the physical participation in this session. And uh, I also should thank to my two colleagues in the panel who uh, for their tireless efforts on this, uh, make this success. Um, so we conclude this panel discussion.
and have a nice day.